I think the ancient philosopher Plato was ahead of his time. He observed something very wise, even though this was thousands of years ago, and he wrote this. He wrote, you know that the beginning is the most important part of any work, especially in the case of a young, tender thing, for that is the time at which the character is being formed and the desired impression is more readily taken. Shall we just carelessly allow children to hear any casual tales, which may be devised by casual persons, and to receive into their minds ideas, for the most part, the very opposite of those which we should wish them to have when they're grown up? We cannot. Anything received into the mind at, the age, at that age is likely to become indelible and unalterable, and therefore it is most important that the tales which the young first hear should be models of virtuous thoughts. You know that the beginning is the most important part of any work. Plato knew what he was talking about. The beginning is the most important part of any work. And we see that everywhere. I mean, you pick up a book and you read the first page, and the first page is the make or break page if you're going to read the rest of the book. The first scene in a movie either focuses us or loses our attention. I'm not an expert chess player, but I hear that the first few moves in chess determine or set the stage for the rest of the game. Uh, when you're building something, the foundation is the most important part. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things. Right at the beginning, that is the most formative part. The most important part is the beginning. So, how do we begin a relationship with God? Or, if we already have or are involved in a relationship with God, how do we begin each day? If we begin each day in a certain way or in certain ways, how does that shape our relationship with God? A lot of people have asked me over many years, if I am trying to learn about God, if I'm trying to read the Bible for the first time or with fresh eyes, if I'm just starting new in a relationship with God, what should I read first in the Bible? And I used to always say the Gospel of John. Start with John. Because that will give you a great summary of who Jesus is and how this all worked. So, after I gave that advice to a number of people, I decided maybe I should read the Gospel of John with fresh eyes, trying to imagine that I've never read it before, and I had no idea what it says, and try to read it with, from that perspective. So I did, and I thought, wow, this is really confusing. I'm not sure this is as clear as I thought it was. So then I changed my answer to the question of where should I start? Where could I possibly start in the Bible? Where could I possibly start learning about God? I changed my decision to the book of Mark. Because Mark is shorter, and it's quicker, and it doesn't take as long to get through, and it has shorter stories. And I thought, well, that's got to be the place to start. Then I realized, well, wait a minute. Mark miss or just ignores the whole first part of Jesus' life. And so it's like opening a book halfway through. You miss the whole first part. Well, if you asked me today or recently, where should I start? If I start anywhere in the Bible, if I'm trying to learn about God, where should I start? Guess what book I'd say? Deuteronomy. I've mean, been looking at Deuteronomy for the last couple weeks, and I have realized, I know that's a total turnoff to like learning about God, isn't it? Just read Deuteronomy. People are not going to be excited about that. But it is because it has some of the most formative pieces about where to begin when we're in a relationship with God, when we're trying to discover who God is and what a relationship with God looks like. In fact, Deuteronomy is full of Moses' speeches to people at a time in their lives when they were discovering a brand new relationship with God in a brand new place. So it is this new beginning of a new relationship with God and starting days out in new ways, beginning in new ways with God. Book of Deuteronomy. We've been looking at it for the last few weeks. We've been looking at these few chapters, 4, 5, and 6, to see what are these precious and rare and kind of valuable, golden, we've called them, kinds of things that God reveals about God and about us and about how a relationship with God looks and works. Well, this passage that we're looking at today is very much that. It is one of the most popular, one of the most formative passages about what it means to be in a relationship with God. And I'm certainly not the only one who would say that this is one of those kinds of passages. 
For thousands of years, this, these verses are verses that have been prayed by millions and millions of people, especially faithful Jewish people all around the world. They pray them, in fact, in the morning and in the evening, multiple times a day, and they're memorized and they have them on the forefronts of their minds. It's this prayer that we've looked at before a couple months ago. We looked at this prayer called the Shema, which is this one of the two basic Jewish prayers that's prayed. And it comes from the first word in this passage. Uh, Shema means hear, as in hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Shema means hear, so that's why they call it the Shema prayer. And it is incredibly informative about what it means to begin a relationship with God or begin every day in a relationship with God. Jesus also pointed out this prayer when he was asked what's the most important commandment, what's the most important anything in the law, Jesus pointed to this prayer. Here is where the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. So there's got to be something here that's in, that's formative for any of us about a relationship with God and what that looks like and how to start it fresh. So it's printed in your bulletin or you can flip open your Bible or it's up on the screen. Anyway, follow along and let's read these few verses. Listen or hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to see these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And we have a visual of the doorposts and God's commands on the doorposts. So if God wants us to begin anywhere and to do anything, what is it that God, said, God says in the passage through Moses, this is what I want you to do? What's the basic thing that God is calling us to do? To, to love the Lord our God. To love God. And at least for me, that brings up all kinds of questions. Like, what does it mean to love God? What does it look like to love God? How do I actually love God? When do I love God? Where do I love God? What do I do when I love God? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Hebrew people were very philosophical, just like I think a lot of us are in our day and age. And when they heard heart, soul, and strength, they heard something similar, I think, to us, and some things a little bit different than us. For them, the heart of a person was the center of a person. But the heart to them was centered in the mind, because the mind makes all the decisions. The mind dictates the body's actions. So when they hear, love the Lord your God with all your heart, they're thinking the center of themselves, that thing that guides them in everything. When they heard soul, they heard something very similar to what we would think of. And what do you think of when you think of soul? Your soul, that is what? Your spirit, in other words. Your innermost being. Yeah, it's the core of who we are. And where is our soul? Can you point to your soul? No. We have no idea where our soul is. I mean, it just is. It's the essence of who we are. And it's kind of mysterious that it just is who we are. When they heard strength, they did not think muscles and lifting and physical strength. They heard and thought of their resources and their wealth and their possessions. You know, the, the stuff that they had, that was their might or their strength. So to love the Lord your God with all your heart was the center of yourself. To love the Lord your God with your soul was, you know, your inmost being, who you are. And to love the Lord your God with all your strength was to love your Lord your God with all your stuff. You know, everything you own, all of your resources, that was how you love the Lord your God. And if we, put, if we put all that together, I mean, that's like all of us, right? I mean, love the Lord your God completely. I think that's what he's saying. Love God completely with everything we have and everything that we are. 
When we think about loving God, I think it's easy to think about loving God emotionally. Because when we say, I love you, when we think about love, I think we often think, in our culture, we think about loving emotionally, or the, the emotions of love. Check out the descriptions of what it looks like to love God in this passage. There's a number of them. Committing, repeating, and talking, and tying, and wearing, and writing God's commands and God's ways. In other words, keep God's commands and ways by, by keeping them close to us. Uh, keep them nearby, memorize them, talk about them, internalize them, uh, figure out what they mean, work them through, analyze them, study them, share them. I mean, do all these things with God's commands so that we're then, through that, loving God. The, the people in the first century had some interesting ways of following these commands. Specifically, the command of uh, writing, of wearing God's commands on our, on our hands and on our foreheads. When God said those things, they took them very, very specifically and very literally. And so was born the phylactery. Phylacteries were born, and they were these things that they would wear on their foreheads. They were small boxes, and they have straps around them to tie this box to your forehead. Inside the box is a small scroll, and on the scroll are four different verses that are written by a scribe in very perfect Hebrew handwriting, and it's rolled up and put inside the box. The four verses are the four places in the Old Testament where it says to wear God's commands or God's ways on our foreheads. And there are four places where it says that. So they would literally put them in a box, wear the box around their head on, on their forehead, and you can still get a phylactery on Amazon for $155. <laughs> then there was the command to write God's commands on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. So the mezuzah was born. And it's a small case, not too dissimilar from the phylactery, but it contains the same thing, a small scroll with a verse on it, and it's in fact this verse, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, that we're looking at today. It's written on a scroll, it's rolled up, and it's put inside this case. And once it's put inside there, people would attach it, and still do, to the door frames of their houses. They're very small, and they, there's many different styles. It has a, the Hebrew letter that's the first letter of this whole prayer that's inscribed on it, and these are highly popular. Um, it reminded people when they came into their house of what it was that they were following. I think it marked these houses as places where people who were striving to follow God lived. And it was a physical sign, a reminder, whenever you passed by, of what God was doing, and who God was, and what God calls us to do, and how God calls us to live. And even though some of these things might sound a little strange, we have our own customs and habits, too. I mean, we put sticky notes on mirrors, or we put note cards in a pocket, or we wear shirts that have biblical sayings sometimes. We... We talk about things with people, we go to Bible study groups, we listen to people who talk about things related to the Bible, which some people memorize scripture passages and commands of God. I mean, we all have habits of trying to get at this whole idea of how do we love God in these ways where we, we write God's words on our hearts, where we do these things that this passage says, trying to understand what is it, how is it, that we can love God in these kinds of ways. This is all part of how we love God completely. If we look at this passage in one other way, there's another piece to it. If we look at the passage, I think it reveals when and where and how we love God. Is it certain times? Is it certain places? What does that look like? God through Moses encourages us to love God in all kinds of ways, and here's some of the ways through ourselves, our children, at home, on the road, when we're going to bed, when we get up, with our bodies, at our homes, and our, and our gates. It's a lot of places. I think there's a couple things worth noting. First, God is not just private and personal, as if my faith and my effort at loving God is just between me and God. 
I mean, in this passage, it talks about children and people and sharing them and being outside and inside. It's not just something I do in the privacy of my room between me and God. This is a public thing, too. The other thing is this whole thing about posting God's commands or God's ways on our gates. These were not gates to their properties, or like, like they had estates and they had gates around them. Gates refers to city gates. Like when you approached a city, there was a big wall and a gate. And what if God's words were posted on the gates as if it's marking that city as a people of God who are striving to follow God? I mean, if this is not public, oh, this is very public. God's ways and striving to love God, this is a very public and shared and out there kind of an effort. God calls us to love God completely, always and everywhere. I'm not a huge basketball fan, but, and I don't follow basketball all that much, but it's hard to miss what's happened this year with the Golden State Warriors. I mean, a team that has won more games than any other team ever in the history of basketball. They started and won 24 straight games at the beginning of the season. They've never lost to the same team twice. And of course, they have some star players who uh, score most of their points, and they've even managed to do well in the playoffs without one of them. I mean, they have done an incredible kind of thing, and it's hard to pass that up. I've heard a number of people say, and I think I probably agree, that the Golden State Warriors, they have dominated basketball. And I wonder, what if loving God dominated us? You know, what if when we thought about the day ahead, we thought about the decisions we're making, the people that we're interacting with, the things we're doing, what if God's love or love for God dominated what we did? You know, it dominated the problem that we're going to encounter. It dominated the test that we're going to take at school. It dominated the friend that we have that we don't get along with very well. It dominated how competitive we're going to be in that game. It dominated how we're going to treat the person that we see who's in need. It dominated how we're going to greet somebody that we don't like. It dominates how we're going to make decisions. I mean, what if the love of God and our love for God dominates what we do every day? See, I think if, if God's love dominates us, then we're going to be a whole lot more focused on God than on ourselves. Because if, if, if my... If, love for myself dominates me, then I'm going to think about how I'm going to win, or how I'm going to come out on top, or the things that I'm going to do. But if, my, if love for God dominates me, then I'm going to think about God, and what God wants for the things in my life. Uh, my senior year in college, I became increasingly interested in graphic design. And I decided that if I was ever going to get a job in graphic design, I'd better actually get some experience in graphic design because I had very little. So I ended up applying for an internship and this gracious man actually hired me as an intern. His name was Kip Bradley and Kip was a very smart man. He brought me in as an intern and so for several months, my senior year and then a little bit into the summer, I spent many, many days sitting at his computer in his office. He owned a commercial real estate management company and on the side, he produced those small desk calendars that used to be super popular. You know, those like six inch, eight inch square things that had lots and lots of paper. You tore one off every day of the year, or you flipped it over the top, and they had, you know, spiritual sayings, or, you know, the, the greatest presidents ever, or, you know, what to cook for dinner tonight, or you know, whatever they were, they, we all had these desk calendars, right? He worked for the company that made most of these. And so what he did is he outsourced to me. So every day I would go into his office at his computer and I would sit down and I would do the monotonous work of laying out these calendars. You know, they're exactly the same every day, just a different day and different text. And every day I'd go in and I would do this calendar after calendar after calendar. And at the end, I would hand the calendars off to him. I'd do a few a day, usually. I'd hand them off to him, he'd check them, 
and then he would send them off to the company or his contact that he worked with, and he would get all the thank yous, Kip would get all the free calendars, Kip would get the paycheck, I mean, Kip got all the accolades. And that's when I realized that I was working to make somebody else look good. And that's what we're doing when we're loving God. We're working to make God look good. Because when our love for God dominates us, we're working to make God look good. We're not working to make ourselves look good. We're not loving God to make us look good. We're loving God to make God look good. And when that happens, when this public thing of loving God happens, people can see that and they get to discover that these ways of God can form a relationship with God from the beginning or every new day that we're in a relationship with God. When we're loving God, people can see that loving God can create a new beginning for anybody. One of my prayers for us as a church is that we love God in these kinds of ways that are overtly public. That people can see that and they see that there is a new, fresh beginning opportunity for them anytime, any day, and for anyone. Those are the people that I want to be praying for and that we get the chance to share God with. Let's pray.